I couldn't agree more. Sauvignon Blanc and goat's cheese were made to go together. They were. And, you know, if we go back to Old World, it's Chev, which is goat's cheese, and Sancerre from the Loire Valley, which is Sauvignon Blanc. So it actually also works very nicely. I guess it's that grassiness or the fresh meadowy note in both the cheese and the wine. What do you think brings them together? I think goat's cheese does have a nice little tartness. And obviously Sauvignon Blanc has that crisp acidity, but also that slight creaminess of the cheese. It's nice to have something fresh and acidic just to cut through that. But yeah, I hadn't thought about that grassiness, but I think that's a really good description. We'll go with that. <laughs> so, <laughs> well done. <laughs> Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 112. How does the unique geography and climate of Hawke's Bay and Gimlet Gravels in New Zealand create wines unlike any others? How does New Zealand's Syrah differ from those from other regions? And why do many winemakers seem to have a special love for Chardonnay? That's exactly what you'll discover on this episode of the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm chatting with New Zealand winemaker Richard Painter, who is with Tioa and Left Field Wines. He has some great stories and wines to share. This conversation took place on my Facebook Live video show several years ago, so please keep that in mind for the context for Richard's comments. He mentions the New Zealand Wine Fair, which is happening this year, but online due to COVID. In the show notes, you'll find links to the wines we tasted, the video version of this chat, and a full transcript, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find me live on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube video every second Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 112. I'm hosting virtual wine and chocolate pairing classes for several corporate groups and other organizations as it's a great tie-in with Valentine's Day, and attendees can participate at home with their loved ones. I'll also be hosting wine and cheese tastings. If you're interested in my doing this for your group, please email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com. You'll also find my contact in the show notes. Now, on a personal note before we dive into the show, I'm not sure why, but I love tracking packages that are being delivered to me from the time I place an online order for anything to the time it's delivered. I leave my browser tab open and I refresh it every morning and every night to see where that package is. I get a little dopamine hit with every email update notification. In fact, it almost makes me want to order something from the other side of the world, say like a wine from New Zealand. Almost. Is this just vicarious travel in the time of COVID? I actually don't think so because I did this before COVID. Perhaps it's just the joy of anticipation, the way I look forward to going out for a dinner. What about you? Is the anticipation of something a big part of the actual something? I'd love to hear from you about this. Tag me on social media at Natalie McLean on Facebook or Twitter or on Instagram at Natalie McLean Wine. Okay, on with the show. We are talking with Richard Painter from New Zealand. He is actually logging in from New Zealand. We're going to talk about the different wines you make, Leftfield Winery, these amazing labels. We've got the New Zealand Wine Fair coming to Canada, so we've got lots to talk about. First of all, welcome, Richard, and we're so glad you could join us. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure. Excellent, excellent. I know that you started off with a science degree, but why don't you fill in the gaps? How did you 
come to winemaking? Was winemaking in your family or how did you get here? Uh, winemaking wasn't necessarily in my family, but I did grow up in a household where wine was always on the table. My parents used to visit vineyards and wineries and I'd get dragged along in tow as a child. So I guess it was always around. And even as a teenager, got to enjoy the odd glass of wine at dinner. But at university, I studied geography as a Bachelor of Science. And then after studying geography, I was actually in hospitality, managing a bar. And the owner and I used to go to a lot of wine tastings. And it was then when I sort of found I had a real affinity for wine and realised that the whole process of making wine actually tied in quite well to geography. Mm -hmm. It was all about soils and climate and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So from there, it was a natural progression, really. I studied winemaking as a postgraduate diploma and went from there. Wow. Well, I love that you come at it from geography because that's the big thing in wine, of course. It's all about terroir, which is the term we hear all the time thrown around. Yeah. A fancy pants term for climate and soil and local weather and a variety of factors, even including the winemaker's decisions. I don't want to be too technical right off the bat, but rather than talk about terroir, what impact does geography play for you in the wines that you make now? Because I know you're in the Hawke's Bay of New Zealand and this little tiny region of gimblet gravels, if I'm saying it correctly, what makes this patch of earth really special, Richard? Yeah, Tiawa Winery is located right on the Gimlet Gravels. It's actually unique in that it sits on the edge of Gimlet Gravels. So we straddle two different subregions. One is the Gimlet Gravels, which is just a very gravelly soil, and the other is the Bridge Par Triangle, which is still gravelly but has silt over the top. So that's what makes Tiawa really unique. But I think the Gimlet Gravels in particular is very unique. It's a finite area of 800 hectares and it's an old riverbed. And only as recently as 150 years ago, that river moved about two kilometres to the north after a big flood event. So it left a very pure, fresh, young soil that is all stones with a little bit of sand and silt mixed in. It's very infertile soil, which is not great for farming. The story has it in New Zealand, you could only grow one sheep per hectare on this <laughs> land, which in farming terms is not very much. No. Um, as you know, New Zealand's a land of sheep, so that's how we measure things. So people thought it was wasteland. And then in the 80s, a group of local wine growers saw the potential of this land for growing fine wine grapes, in particular red grapes such as Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah. They started planting it and um, that infertile soil combined with a really warm local microclimate, um, the area is actually a slightly warmer than the rest of Hawke's Bay as well. So that combination of warmth and very infertile soil means it, it grows very lovely red wines, uh, particularly those Bordeaux varieties and Syrah. Wow, that's quite an array. Now, you mentioned you love Chardonnay. I've got the left field Chardonnay. So what would be maybe your favorite food pairing with that one, Richard? The left field Chardonnay, it's a lighter style of Chardonnay. So it's what I call a lightly oaked Chardonnay. It's fermented in a mix of stainless steel and oak barrels. So it's not a big, heavy wine is what I'm getting at. So I think that style of wine is lovely with seafood. In New Zealand, we have a, one of the, our most common white fish is called snapper. I'm not sure if you have snapper bread. And it's a lovely sort of firm-fleshed white fish and they're sort of small enough that you can pan fry a whole one. And I, I just love nothing more than a big whole pan-fried snapper with just a little bit of lemon for flavouring. And something like that just goes really well with that left field chardonnay. Oh, you're making my mouth water, which is really excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and how would you describe this chardonnay in particular, this left field chardonnay? So as I said, the, the left field Chardonnay, it's a lighter style of Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. You get a little hint of that French oak flavour in it, but it has lovely citrus, particularly lemon flavours. And in Hawke's Bay, you also get some lovely stone fruit flavours, so slight peach and nectarine flavours come through. And then although Hawke's Bay is a warm part of New Zealand, the wines retain a lovely acidity, so the wine has a lovely fresh acidity in that. And so you say it's a warm area, yet it has freshness. Is that because the nights are cool in the Hawke's Bay? Yes, I think New Zealand as a whole is a cool climate wine growing country. So even though we're in the, probably the warmest wine growing area of New Zealand, it's still coolish. 
and we're not so far from the coast, so you do get cooler air coming in from the sea. That just gets the climate temperate, and it never gets too hot. And you're right, the nights get quite cool, particularly later in autumn as the grapes get ready to be harvested. Yeah, and your autumn is now, right? You're Southern Hemisphere, so you're into harvest right now, correct? Finished harvest, actually, in Italy. It's been the earliest finish we've had that I can remember. It's been amazing. So uh, That's great. I've actually had a couple of weekends off, which is good. <laughs> wow. They must get you on a plane to a trade show somewhere. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> a, wine, a winemaker with a few weekends off. Unheard of. <laughs> okay, tonight, Lucy is having lobster. So what would be your suggested pairing for that, Richard? For Sauvignon Blanc, I just love shellfish. In New Zealand, we farm a lot of green lip mussels, particularly around the Marlborough region, which is sort of one of the homes of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. So, you know, a big bowl of fresh mussels, maybe just with a lemon broth, something like that would go really nicely with Sauvignon Blanc. And those lovely, fresh, herbaceous flavours and firm acidity of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc will really accentuate some of those lovely shellfish flavours. If you can't get mussels, then, you know, a bowl of clams or... Even scallops, although scallops, I tend to go more for a chardonnay. But yeah, good for a ship, but she can't beat it. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Now, Richard, of course, I'm really intrigued by all of the labels from your wine. So I try not, as a person who writes about wine, to be drawn in by the labels, but these are irresistible. So what's going on with all of these really iconic, almost crazy dream <laughs> illustrations on your labels. Let's talk about the one on this Chardonnay. Where is this coming from? Who did this and what's the backstory? Yeah, they're fantastic, aren't they? They are. The, to just delve into the backstory a little bit, how I just explained on the Tiawa vineyard, we have two very different soil types. So the genesis of left field was really 10 or 12 years ago. The winemaker at the time took grapes from the more silty bridge par triangle side of the vineyard and made a different range of wines called left field wines. Because the thing with Gimlet Gravels is it's, it's basically an appellation and a trademark. So for a wine to be labelled Gimlet Gravels, it has to be 95% from the Gimlet Gravels area. So we had half of our vineyard, which wasn't Gimlet Gravels, that we needed to release wines from that half of the vineyard. And at the time, they always called it the left field of the vineyard. So it was really a physical reference to a part of the vineyard. And then about three or four years ago, we took left field and we decided it had such a strong brand name. And we decided to play on that second meaning of something being from the left field or something being a little left of centre, you know, a little bit quirky, so to speak. So we went to a local designer, Aaron Pollock, and we asked him to design a label and some illustrations and his design brief was basically can you come up with something from the left field and then he came up with these amazing illustrations so they're actually taken out of an old biology textbook like a hundred year old biology textbook so if you look at them they really look like you know old hand drawings out of a old biology textbook and he's taken several different creatures and blended them together to come up with mythical creations Um, so on the chardonnay it's called the lizard fish and then what's really interesting, I don't know if you can see it, I'll yep. try and hold up, but there's yep. a little picture of a windmill drawn into all of the pictures. Every wine has a different label. And the windmill was really the icon of Tiawa. We've got this beautiful old windmill at our front gate, which used to be used to draw water up from the aquifer below us when the property was a farm. So each of the labels does have elements of that windmill drawn in, but they're very pretty. They are. And I've even got the Pinot Gris and you can see the little windmills coming out of this crustacean on the side of it so does the windmill at all help with you know in some wineries it's taking the warm air and flushing it down through the vines to keep the vines warm in colder periods yes we've got plenty of those scattered around our vineyard so therefore frost fighting obviously being a cool climate for the culture area we do get late spring frosts so I quite like the fact the windmill is the symbol of Tiawa because we've got this beautiful old windmill at our gate, which used to be used for drawing water up to be used for the farm. And now we have all these modern windmills or wooden machines scattered around the vineyard. So it's sort of a, a modern incarnation of the old windmill. It's quite cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So I'm curious because Chardonnay has, well, you know, it's been through the thing, ABC, anything but Chardonnay, but you're calling it a winemaker's wine. 
So tell me what your fascination is, perhaps love is, of Chardonnay. So a lot of people like to bash Chardonnay, but why yeah. do you like it? I think a lot of winemakers will like Chardonnay because it's a wine you can really have a bit of stylistic imprint on it. Sure. There's so many different styles of Chardonnay from very sort of lean, minerally, almost chablis like Chardonnays through to very fat, rich, oaky Chardonnays. So there's a real breadth of flavours you can have in Chardonnay, so you can really bring a bit of your own influence to it. Whereas a lot of other wines, aromatic white wines in particular, and you know, they're very sort of clean and very transparent of where the wine's grown and things like that. So I think winemakers like Chardonnay because they can put a bit of their own personality into the wine and have a bit of fun. Right. And what do you try to achieve with Chardonnay? Is there a signature? Is there a way you would describe your Chardonnay, especially from left field? I think the idea, we make several Chardonnays here at Tiawa. So the, the left field one is a lighter style. The first ever left field wine was actually an unoaked Chardonnay produced in 2006. So over the years, we've introduced more oak barrels purely because I think it makes better wine, oak Chardonnays. We've kept it in that lighter, easy to drink style. Like I said, lovely citrus and stone fruit flavours. But we also try and give the wine a little bit of generosity through malolactic fermentation. And then we make an estate Chardonnay, the Tiawa Single Estate Chardonnay, and that's a step up in terms of it's a bit richer, fuller bodied, and it also has a bit more flinty complexity from natural ferment. So the two quite distinct wines. Yeah, so Tiawa is the winery. Would you call left field like a sub-label or is it its own winery? How do you separate the two or do you? Yeah, Leftfield, we call our wines the Tiawa Collection. So Leftfield sits in the Tiawa Collection. Okay. The big difference with Leftfield is we take grapes from around the country, so from different vineyard sites around the country and also different vineyard sites around Hawke's Bay to make those wines. And then our Tiawa single estate wines are all made from grapes grown on the Tiawa estate. So they're two quite separate labels in that sense, but they're all made here at the Tiawa Winery of Hawke's Bay. Okay, cool. Um, Jason says, I agree with Richard about the whitefish and shellfish pairing with Sauvignon Blanc, but the high acidity in Sauvignon Blanc also makes it a great pairing with zesty, citrusy summer salads, especially those with vinaigrette dressings. Any comments there, Richard? I couldn't agree more. And actually, I'll tell you, one thing I'd add to that salad is some nice goat's cheese, because I tell you what, Sauvignon Blanc and goat's cheese were made to go together. They were. And, you know, if we go back to Old World, it's Chev, which is goat's cheese, and Sancerre from the Loire Valley, which is Sauvignon Blanc. So it actually also works very nicely. I guess it's that grassiness or the fresh meadowy note in both the cheese and the wine. What, what do you think brings them together? Yeah, I'm not so sure. I think maybe, you know, goat's cheese does have a nice little tartness. And obviously, Sauvignon Blanc has that crisp acidity. But also, that slight creaminess of the cheese, it's nice to have something fresh and acidic just to cut through that. But yeah, I hadn't thought about that grassiness, but I think that's a really good description. We'll go with that. <laughs> so, <laughs> well <done. laughs> okay, so I'm curious, I'm going to go back to a picture I have of you, Richard, and I'm going to show it on the screen now. Your dog, what's his name and what's his connection with the vineyard? My dog's name is Sam, so he is an interesting mix of Labrador and, and New Zealand sheepdog. <laughs> so he's a big black hairy dog is his breed, as I call it. So Sam comes to work with me each day. He much prefers running around the vineyard than sitting in the lab or wandering around the winery. So he um, looks forward to his end of day walk around the vineyard very so much. He's not an analytical dog. He's more of a out there in the field dog. He is. That's great. And how long has he been around the vineyard? So he must be about six now. So, yeah, I've been working at Yawa since 2013. So he's been running around here for about the last four years. Oh, that's so sweet. All right. So I have got a pile of your wines. I've gotten lost in the conversation, as I usually do. So let's make sure we get through some of these wines. We've talked about the Chardonnay. We've talked about the Sauvignon Blanc. Let me bring up some others. I have the Rosé, which is super fresh. I opened and tasted these wines just before our conversation, but maybe tell us a little bit about the rosé, the grape base, and kind of the style you're going for, that sort of thing. Yeah, so the rosé, it's quite uniquely left field, I think. 
and it's probably the most left field of all the wines we make. So it's a blend of several different grape varieties. So we use some Pinotage, which is grown here on the Tiawa vineyard. That's usually and South we, Africa. It is, yeah. yeah. It's usually South Africa. and It's pretty rare in New Zealand now, uh, Pinotage, but I think it makes a lovely rosé wine. It's you know, so it's fresh. half Pinot Noir and half Senso. And both those grapes individually make lovely rosés. So Pinotage, for me, is the perfect rosé grape. Uh, but we actually also use some Arnais. So Arnais is an Italian white variety and it's very fresh and floral. Mm. We also grow some of that here in the place. So I actually take the two grapes and blend them together. So it's almost a bit of a blush style rosé. So I always use that as the base for my rosé. And then depending on what volume I need, I quite often top it up with some Merlot that I make into rosé and also some Pinot Gris. I don't get hung up on what grapes I use to make the rosé. I just use different wines to blend together to try and make the perfect rosé. Oh, wow. So I try and make it light, just off dry style. So it's mm. got about five to six grams per litre sugar. So just a hint of sweetness to balance out any natural acidity. And I try and go for a lovely pale salmon colour. I think you've done your job, Richard. This doesn't come off with any sort of sweetness, only a sort of fresh, tiny, strawberry fields forever kind of summery note. There's no residual sugar heaviness, nothing. It's dry and crisp. It's lovely. It's so light. So chilled as an aperitif or a companion to, I don't know, plant salmon or even lighter fare, maybe? Yeah, I think we even say pair it with salmon on the label. But yeah, rosé for me is the perfect lunchtime wine as well, which is Part of the reason we keep it nice and free, uh, light and fresh and crisp. I should only have 12 or 12 and a half percent alcohol. Mm-hmm. But for me, yeah, lunchtime or as an aperitif, it's just perfect. I love that you talk about lunchtime wines. <laughs> Excellent. This is 12.5%. That's lovely. And it is just so fresh, just even in the glass. And then, of course, with um, rosé, do you suggest generally, particularly with your rosé, you enjoy them young, the vintage they're made, or maybe two years after max? Yes, I think so. For me, rosé is not a wine you sell it. You drink it young while it's lovely and fresh. Uh, but certainly after two years, they still taste very good. But it, I recommend drinking them young. Okay, good. All right, let's motor through here. We've got the Chardonnay, and we've done the Tiawa. Can you help me pronounce that again? Tiawa? Tiawa. Tiawa. Yes. It's Māori, the Māori. indigenous people of New Zealand, and Tiawa means the river. So. The river, okay, yes, because I've seen the T-E as a sort of um, prefix on some other wine labels and terms out of New Zealand, so it's good to know. T-E oh. basically means the. The, that makes sense, <laughs> okay, that totally makes sense. Let me just see if I have any other whites here. I have, maybe we should clarify what we can get here. In Ontario, of course, we have people clocking in and watching us from around the world. So in New Zealand, lucky people, you can probably get most of these. But here in Ontario or generally across Canada, I believe it's mostly, is it the Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir or something like that? Maybe you can remind us of what's here right now or coming up soon. The Sauvignon Blanc is the only one that's been released officially. And then we're hoping to get the rest of the range in shortly. Sure. And that's that one, that flying fish with an onion at the base. That's very interesting. Okay, so, but I was trying the Pinot Gris, and I thought that was really superbly fresh. And often I find Pinot Gris can be kind of what I call beige wines, really boring, like choosing white for your walls in your house. But why is this one so fresh and aromatic? What have you done here? (laughs) (laughs) Crikey. We grow our Pinot Gris here in Hawke's Bay, and most New Zealand Pinot Gris tend to be grown in some of the cooler parts of New Zealand, so your Marlborough, Central Otago, Martinborough, you know, places where they typically grow Pinot Noir. So what we do is we grow it in Hawke's Bay because I love the warmth, gives extra rich fruit flavour, and what it means is you get a lot of flavour packed into the grapes, and you don't need to leave as much residual sugar in the wine to give it flavour. I certainly agree with you that often Pinot Gris can be a little bit beige. 
But what we do is we grow the Pinot Gris in a cooler inland valley of Hawke's Bay. So whilst it's warmer, it is cooler than where we are here on the Gimlet Gravels. So that helps retain natural acidity and freshness to the wine. But other than that, it's not too many tricks. Mostly just fermented in stainless steel tanks using nice aromatic yeast to bring forth some of those flavours. It's an interesting thing about Pinot Gris is that when it's fermenting, it's the most flavourful an aromatic wine you can ever taste. And then when it finishes fermenting, it seems to just drop off. <laughs> um, it's about trying to lock in those flavours somehow. Yeah. Like uh, childhood, lots of ballet training and then just flops on the recital. But yours doesn't. So that's okay. <laughs> it's good. It's good to hear. <laughs> all right. Let me see what else I've got here because I think I've gone through all the whites. Let's dive into the reds. Let's start with the Syrah, and here is the windmill again atop a flying boat or something. Uh, Rip Van Winkle. A flying boat ship. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's cool. So talk about Syrah because I'm a big fan of cool climate Syrah from New Zealand, especially that nice peppery. But what's happening with Syrah in a cool climate such as yours? Yeah, so Syrah is becoming a very exciting variety for us here in Hawke's Bay and the Gimlet Gravels in particular. And historically, there's been a real focus on Merlot and Cabernet style blends, but latently Syrah is becoming the real darling of Hawke's Bay red wines. It's a very distinctive style, like you say, quite peppery and spicy, but you also get those lovely black fruits, dark berries, and they retain a lovely fresh acidity as well, which makes them stay fresh but they also age really well so very distinctive and very different to say an Australian Shiraz which is quite a big rich almost jammy wine New Zealand Syrah is almost closer to Pinot Noir and that it's quite fresh and aromatic a um, little bit of spice so Syrah is very exciting and I think for Hawke's Bay the future of red wine probably lies more in the Syrah camp than the, the traditional Bordeaux blends. That's really interesting because I get that the pepper and the darkness, and but still, it's bright at the core. It's not heavy. It's really an exciting wine with a lot of potential. I love Syrah in the Rhone Valley. Of course, perhaps that could be considered its home or starting place. But as an example in New Zealand, I think this is fantastic. It's got the, the best of both with the balance of richness and yet that lifted vibrancy at the core. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. The New Zealand Syrah model is very much um, that Northern Rhone style where they are more elegant and aromatic and fresh rather than the, say, Southern Rhone, which seem to be a bit riper and full of body. That's true. Let me see. What else do we have here? Because I've got more. I love this Pinot Noir. So, of course, New Zealand is trending on Pinot Noir these days. What are you doing with your Pinot Noir from left field? So our Pinot Noir is from the Marlborough region, so top of the South Island. So we do tend to think Hawke's Bay is a bit warm for Pinot. We head south. Historically, we have made it from the Nelson region, which is on the west northwestern part of the South Island, but we've recently moved it to Marlborough, which is probably New Zealand's most famous wine region um, on, the, on the back of the Sauvignon Blanc that comes from there. So typically, Marlborough Pinot Noirs have lovely red fruit flavours, so red cherry, strawberry. They also have lovely spice. Like I always think of a bit of sort of raspberries and cherries with a bit of cinnamon on top, you know, that, that's Marlborough Pinot Noir. So the idea with our left field Pinot Noir is it's a lighter style, very easy to drink, and we make it in a fairly affordable style. So it's made in old oak barrels. It helps keep the cost down. And it's a, really a sort of drink young to medium aged type wine. So it's a very easy drinking peanut wine. Absolutely. One to enjoy every night. Oh, yeah. Selfishly, I hope this one comes next. After the Sauvignon Blanc, I'm a huge fan of New Zealand Pinot because I just think the balance is there. And yet we're not paying burgundy prices. So it's interesting. What do we got going on here? We got a, um, not a stork. What is that? Pink flamingos. And Pink then, flamingo. He's a, he's a flamingo on a windmill. So, again, it looks like someone had a bad dream and put it on a label, but in an yeah. artistic way. Oh, and he's got, you know what I like? Figure two. It's like it's out of a biology textbook. That is so cool. 
And we have another one here. We have got your Merlot, and this is somehow a deer hatching out of an egg. Do you know? Yeah, the hatchling deer. So that's one of my favorite labels, actually. I think nothing like a deer head to, you know, when you're drinking a nice rich red wine, you think of sitting next to the fire in a hunting lodge or something. Like that. Sure, we think of that, but not coming out of an egg. <laughs> so why <laughs> yeah. is it coming out of the egg? Yeah, it's pretty left field. <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. So that could be the default explanation. It's left field. Okay, so describe this one then, Merlot. Yeah, so Merlot, it's the most widely planted red grape here in Hawke's Bay. So okay. this wine is grown on the Tiawa Estate. Mm -hmm. That's the 2015, I think, you have there, isn't it? I it's do. a lovely... Yes. That wine actually has a good lashing of Cabernet Franc and a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon in it as well. So it's about 88% Merlot. So it's actually a bit more of a Merlot blend. For me, it's a really classical Bordeaux-style blend. So it's quite young, but the left-field wines are all made that they can be drunk young, aged in French oak barrels. So you get those lovely sort of plum, black Doris plum notes that you get with good Merlot. And a little dose of Cabernet Franc adds some lovely perfume and floral notes to the aroma. So I think that's a very sort of elegant expression of a Merlot blend. What kind of plum did you say? Doris plum? Black, uh, Black Doris plum. Doris. Yeah, it's a type of plum we get. It's one that's quite often used in baking and cooking and things like that. I'm not sure if you have it, but it's quite a dark plum with red flesh. Like Doris in, as in a woman's name, D-O-R-I-S? Yes. Doris, yeah. I'm putting that in a tasting note. <laughs> Black Doris plum. This sounds like Doris on a bad day, but... <laughs> brooding or whatever dark and fleshy and I love the plummy flavors that come through on that so let me just grab these two over here because we have the Syrah and I have the Merlot Cabernet and it's nice to taste the range so Richard there's actually a great YouTube video of the Leffield creatures that we've made so if you put Leffield wines into YouTube you'd find it so, Richard, is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to mention about Left Field? No, I think we've uh, covered them quite well, but I do urge people, if they can, try and find the bottles or even look online because mm -hmm. they don't just have quirky labels. Each creation actually has its own backstory mm. on the label, which is celebrating that Left Field style design style and so some of those backstories are quite quirky <laughs> if you think the pictures are quirky wait till you read the backstory and also we've used a bit of imaginative language in the tasting notes and things like that so they are quite an imagined whimsical sort of imaginative style of design goes into the whole brand the pictures the tasting notes the descriptors the wines themselves you know they're just very consumer friendly wines very easy to drink good quality and we're also doing a few interesting things. I don't think you have a sample there, uh, Natalie, but one of the wines um, we're really championing is Albarino. I did Zealand. try this. It's not here tonight, but I did try a sample about two weeks ago. It was fantastic. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. that's good to hear. Oh, so yeah. we're making an Albarino from Gisborne, and that's something we're really excited about. We think it's got great potential. We've been making them for about three years now and we export most of it to the UK and Europe, but maybe one day we can get some over to Canada. You know, it's very lovely, fresh, aromatic wine. A lot of those qualities that make New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc just so appealing to people, that freshness and purity and aromatic intensity. We're achieving the same results with Albarino. So that's something really exciting we're doing and hopefully something we can get across to Canada also sometimes soon. That would be good, sooner than later, Richard. But Albarino, of course, we associate with Northern Portugal, fresh, clean, crisp, white grape in that family with Gruner, Veltliner, and some others, of course, Sauvignon Blanc, but these are fantastic. You know, I must say, even though there's a strong branding component going on here and a fascinating backstory with the labels, the wines really stand alone. Even if they had horrendous labels, they really taste fantastic. And I do encourage people to try them. Of course, we can only get the Sauvignon Blanc so far here in Canada, but who knows what the availability is in your region, wherever you're tuning in from. So look out for them. We will put all of the tasting notes in the blog post. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. It was a great conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you everyone out there for joining us. And, oh, yeah, do seek out those left field wines. Hopefully we'll have some more available for you soon. Absolutely. Maybe this will encourage the wine choosing gods. <laughs> but anyway, so you're done your harvest. I don't know what you're going to do, but anyway, you relax and we will talk with you again soon, Richard. Thanks, Emily. Okay, cheers. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Richard Painter. Here are my takeaways. Number one, I admire Richard's love of geography and soil. It's so fundamental to understanding and loving wine. Two, this week, I am definitely trying his suggested pairing of fried snapper with lemon and a zesty, cool climate Chardonnay. Yum. Three, he observed that Chardonnay is often considered a winemaker's wine since it can express so many styles and variations depending on the winemaker's decisions and, of course, the terroir. In the show notes, you'll find links to the wines we tasted, the video version of this chat and a full transcript, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, and where you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube live video every second Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 112. If you're interested in my hosting a wine and cheese or wine and chocolate tasting for your group, please email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com. You'll also find my contact in the show notes. You won't want to miss next week when I'll be chatting with Rudy Rabble, who owns a family-run winery in Austria that makes incredibly zesty white wines like Gruner Veltliner that are a terrific match with seafood, shellfish, vegetarian dishes, and a whole lot more. In the meantime, if you missed episode 9, go back and take a listen. I chat with Ezra Sipes of British Columbia's Summerhill Winery about vegan and vegetarian wines. I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. Our vineyard in Kelowna is certified by Demeter as a biodynamic vineyard. It has extra rules above and beyond organic. So organic is sort of the baseline, which yeah. means that there's no synthetics being used, basically. And then there's guidance on things they want to see about soil preservation and biodiversity and things like that. But biodynamics really codifies that. You have to have at least 10% of your farm given over to nature habitat. And we have, I think, about 20 or 25% of our farm that's wetland. We have a dry land. We have a meadow habitat. And then you really view the farm as an ecosystem. You integrate animals and animal manures, and you really focus on making your own fertilizers from things you grow on the farm. We make a horsetail tea for mildew control. We make large amounts of compost, and we add these herbal preparations to the compost to aid processes of decomposition. We spray basically a bacterial broth all over the farm that aids the life force, if you will, in the soil, but basically the soil food web. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone who'd be interested in the tips that Richard shared. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week, perhaps a zesty Sauvignon Blanc. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.